welcome to CCLA's podcast, Justice Versus. I'm your host, Maria Rio. In a situation where you're fighting for something that's so personal to you, any way that someone who wants to deny your humanity in the world feels like they won, you know, that's a hard thing to have to kind of sit with. But it's also a lesson, which is that the fight never ends. Even in victory, the fight never ends. According to, you know, according to human rights legislation, federally and provincially, it's our responsibility with it, regardless of the curriculum, regardless of uh, the subject area. It's our responsibility to uh, be actively and proactively inclusive of the LGBTQ plus conversation. We have to. The Ontario Health and Physical Education curriculum was overhauled in 2015 to include discussions of gender identity, consent, same-sex relationships, and the impact of stereotypes and stigmas. Many saw this as a positive step, a step towards creating a safer and more inclusive environment for LGBTQ2S students and families. One of those families was Becky McFarland's, whose voice you first heard. Becky is the Director of Programs and Community Services at The 519, a Toronto agency which provides services to queer communities. As a concerned activist and a parent of a then 10-year-old student, Becky believed that curriculum changes would help produce a school environment where queer families like hers would feel supported, represented, and welcomed. I went to public school in the 1980s. It wasn't so much that it was difficult being a member of the LGBTQ2S community. It was more that there was no LGBTQ2S community. And so certainly um, sort of my own struggles related to my sexuality and my sexual identity were sort of happening in a complete vacuum. Um, And certainly I don't even think I had the language to understand Uh, what was going on for me. And I think that's probably the biggest reason why I think um, that I thought this issue was important, mainly visibility. I, I really don't actually think that the building of inclusive spaces for queer and trans students, or even our understanding of the experiences of queer and trans communities um, happens within a sexual health curriculum. I don't think that's where it should actually even primarily uh, live, but I do think it's one of the only parts of curriculum. And I know that there are other aspects of curriculum where experiences of queer and trans people are touched on, but certainly um, Um, health education curriculum is one of the most predominant places it comes up. And so wanting to protect that was hugely important to me. So in 2018, when Premier Doug Ford's government repealed the new curriculum to replace it with material dating back to the late 1990s, Becky and CCLA challenged Ford's change. They argued that the province was violating equality and security of the person's rights guaranteed in Canada's Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Becky and CCLA asked the court to keep the 2015 curriculum in place until the government consulted the public on a new plan. Today, we're joined by Becky to describe this fight for LGBTQ2S inclusion in schools and why queer visibility in schools is critical for youth. Later, we speak to Kyle McGivern, a teacher who uses his position as an educator to normalize queer experiences and produce a queer inclusive school environment. Becky has worked with CCLA in a number of ways, including as a keynote speaker for the annual Alan Voravoid Student Conference. 
This is a conference funded by the Law Foundation of Ontario, where she talked about her own experiences as a high school student. Welcome, Becky. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. When you and CCLA took the province to court, you argued that the province was in violation of Canada's Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which guarantees equality and security to all people in Canada. So what made the 2015 curriculum so important to queer and trans students and how did the change also impact straight and cis students? Why the charter challenge made some sense to me, because I have to be honest and say, I'm not, I'm not necessarily the kind of person who believes that the courts are the place in which sort of human rights and social justice is realized. For me, it was the fact that the government had made a decision to repeal the curriculum. They'd made a decision to take it away. And I thought that that act in and of itself was the thing that actually infringed on um, the rights of students, not so much um, the content of the 2015 curriculum being so critically important, because I would argue that it actually didn't go far enough. Uh, in terms of exploring some of these issues, but rather the message that was sent by the government at the time by by repealing it. And as I'm sure you'll remember, it was one of the first things that the government the government did after it, it was elected. And what it did was send a very chilling um, kind of message to students and to teachers that should um, these conversations be happening in schools in the absence of this kind of process the government was proposing to go through, that there would be consequences. And it was in the context of that sort of chilling effect um, that I felt that there was real danger for, for queer and trans students or for children of queer and trans families, because it actually made conversations around queer and trans experiences and identities something dangerous. And it was in the context of that danger that I felt danger. And I felt that it made sense to kind of approach this from the perspective of a charter challenge. I think the second thing I'll say in terms of your question, it's an incredibly important point. And certainly it was part of kind of my perspective and position uh, in doing this, which is conversations around consent, conversations around healthy sexuality. Those are not things that just benefit queer and trans students. And I think kind of creating an environment of openness, it's positive for everyone. More so protects uh, young people who come from families who, for whatever reason, don't feel comfortable talking about, uh, about these issues. I think a lot of the time when we're talking about this particular struggle, we talk about in the context of homophobia and transphobia and in the context of kind of queer and trans experiences. But the reality is, uh, is this is a conversation about equity that would apply to all students because it's creating an environment that allows young people to make their own decisions and to understand their own experiences uh, in a way that builds um, the kind of confidence and a sense of sort of self-respect uh, and a sense of identity that keeps them safe. So what was the process like working with CCLA to ask the Superior Court of Justice to block the repeal of the 2015 health and physical education curriculum? Um, I mean, I guess the first thing I'd say is that I have a great deal of respect for the work that CCLA does. Having organizations that are at core interested in the protection of people's civil liberties is incredibly important, probably now more than ever. Again, as someone who perhaps has limited faith in institutions being the place from which we advance social justice, um, interested in the process itself, uh, and really thinking about ways in which you know existing systems can increase access to justice um, for marginalized communities. And while I may not have faith in particular systems, I think because people acutely feel the implications of inequity in their daily lives, there's a privilege that comes from saying, I'm not going to use those systems because I don't believe in them. If there is a potential for those systems to actually impact the kind of daily realities for students um, in this context uh, or for families in this context, then why wouldn't I um, take them up? Particularly because I felt that I was in a in a privileged position myself as someone 
who wasn't so afraid of what the fallout might be. I was, I'm an out queer person working in a queer community um, and felt quite capable of being able to kind of navigate whatever the negative pushback was going to be from this particular challenge. At one point, the courts dismissed the action, arguing that the curriculum didn't infringe on any charter rights and was not discriminatory. What was it like to hear that decision? I feel like I had set my expectations from the very beginning and wasn't sure kind of where this was going to land. It felt to me like a stretch, not because I thought that the um, case itself wasn't really, really strong, but, you know, it's not particularly common practice for courts to side against governments. I think, you know, for me at that point, I was really, really interested in kind of seeing what the government was going to do uh, as a consequence in terms of that decision. And um, I think the thing that never really got talked about in relation to the case was that the act itself, I think, put the government in a position where it had to move forward in a way that was reflective of what they said in court. And so in some ways, I felt the victory of the case even before the ruling, because the whole time the government was claiming that there was nothing insidious about their decision to step back, that it wasn't anti-queer or anti-trans, and then went on to talk about all of the amazing things that they do to support queer and trans students. And I saw how angry it made the kind of very right-wing parent groups that were advocating against sex ed curriculum and coming out really, really against the government uh, for the position that they were taking. It didn't really matter at that point what the court was going to say. The fact that the government was was forced to kind of side with queer and trans students anyway, and then subsequently produced a curriculum that was essentially the same, um, was a victory. You mentioned it's essentially the same curriculum. For those who don't know, the curriculum is actually a guideline of learning objectives mandated by the government but it's up to each school board and teacher to figure out the actual course materials and topics students get access to. In 2019, the Ford government released the new health and physical education curriculum, which did include teachings about mental health, gender identity, same-sex relationships, similar topics. The Minister of Education, Stephen Lecce, argued that this version strengthened every single area of the previous plan. How would you assess the 2019 curriculum in comparison to the 2015 one? Certainly my kind of like broad reading of it and, and in my conversations with folks who have really taken a close look, it does feel like for the most part, there isn't any kind of fundamental difference between the two. As I said at the very beginning of this, I don't think that the kind of way in which we teach sexual health is anywhere near where it needs to be. So since you think the curriculum is not where it needs to be, how would you amend it? What would you add? I don't know if it's so much how I would amend it or what I would add. I think everything is about the individual who's teaching the curriculum. There's something that seems a bit dangerous almost about leaving something as important as sexual health completely up to an individual to decide how to teach it. I'm not slighting teachers at all, because I think that the idea that teachers take a curriculum and kind of actualize it um, is the way that it should be. As a society and culturally, it's very, very hard for people to talk about sexual health. Um, and I think that we need to do a lot of work, both with teachers, but also kind of more broadly as a society to find ways to become much more comfortable about having these conversations, because ultimately they are tied to health outcomes. They're tied to mental health outcomes and they're tied to physical health outcomes and they're tied to sexual violence and all sorts of other things. We have an epidemic in our society around things like sexual violence, around sexually transmitted diseases, and around a kind of sort of lack of knowledge and confidence that I feel young people have in relation to being able to have some agency around their bodies. That worries me a lot. I think the more needs to be in the actualization of curriculum and, the, and you know, thinking about better ways to teach it and getting more comfortable having these conversations. What can teachers and students do to engage with parents who are uncomfortable with their children learning about gender or sexual identity as part of the curriculum? 
You know, I think a lot about this and I've always taken the position that it is not my place to judge other people around what they think is appropriate or inappropriate for their child to know. I do think, however, that in a public school system, we need to be very careful about what we kind of situate as being an area where parents should have more or less control. Uh, And it has made me very uncomfortable because we take issues of sexual health and moralize them. It's a problem. We don't do the same thing to a lot of other issues. There's lots of things that I disagree with personally in relation to kinds of the things my kid is taught in school about history, about what constitutes literature. But I recognize that I send her to a public school system and that as a result, I might be able to influence what she knows at home and be able to offer her alternative understandings, be able to place my own kind of political analysis or ideological analysis into what she's learning. But I certainly don't have the right to sort of, you know, bang on the doors of the school demanding that they teach things exactly the way that I think that they should be taught. But we create this kind of exception specific to queer and trans identity, as though somehow that is an exception. We should be upholding the principles of the charter and upholding the principles of human rights legislation in our education system. The fact that we even question that by creating some kind of opt-out for people is just a deeper entrenchment of homophobia and transphobia within an institution. Before we let you go, What advice do you have for listeners to better educate themselves to be part of the efforts to make schools and other spaces more welcoming and affirming for all gender and sexual identities? I think that's a good question. And I think, you know, we're all being called upon to um, be a lot more reflective about our own actions, about our own ignorance, to try to seek out ways that we can learn and understand that doesn't always just involve expecting marginalized communities to do all of the work to educate us. I think that there's still a lot to be said about speaking up. There's not a day that goes by that I'm not in the world where I don't witness some kind of aggression towards a marginalized person or group. And I think that we need to see ourselves as actors in trying to be supportive in circumstances where people are being um, treated terribly right in front of us. And certainly it happens in schools all the time. Like if you hear another parent being homophobic or transphobic, then it's incumbent upon you to say something. But I think if we can imagine the long-term consequences of complicity and silence, which is something we've been living with for far too long, um, it might inspire us to actually, uh, you know, act in the moments where it matters and not just say that we're committed to these issues, which without actually demonstrating that commitment in real ways. And certainly in my own experience, when people have spoken up or called something out in relation to something that has impacted me, um, it has had a significant effect on me. It's nice to know people have your back for real, not just kind of, you know, generally. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Becky. Oh, thanks for having me. As a parent and activist, Becky showed us the importance of making sure freedom of expression is protected in schools and the curriculum. In 2014, CCLA published a guide to LGBTQ rights in schools, referencing a Canadian research survey that stated that queer and non-binary students felt safer and more accepted when their schools had policies that explicitly addressed homophobia. One of the tools to create that safe and inclusive environment is the GSA, which is a gay straight alliance or a gender sexual alliance school club. Something our next guest knows all about as he's co-founded one and has been involved in another. You heard Kyle McGivern's voice at the beginning of the podcast. Kyle is an out LGBTQ2S educator and author and currently teaches in Ontario's Peel District School Board at Thomas Street Middle School. Normalizing the conversation, I think a lot of teachers make the mistake of believing that the queer trans conversation has to be serious and heavy and and we have to really be careful. And to an extent, there's a 
there's logic to that, absolutely, but it doesn't always have to be. Making it as normal and as just part of the routine as possible, that goes miles, miles to making the conversation accessible and comfortable and just part of the experience of the day. Each year, Kyle McGivern shares his own coming out story with his students. He has been invited to speak at numerous schools and universities to describe his experience as an advocate for change. He also serves in advocacy committees aiming to promote inclusion and equity for queer youth in schools. He received the F. Jana Dolman Prize in Playwriting in 2012, and in 2016 published his first novel, Wyburn, which follows the fantastical tale of a young trans character as part of Kyle's efforts to introduce younger audiences to characters who resemble them and to demonstrate the diversity of gender identity. Kyle, thank you so much for joining us today. It's an absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me. How would you describe your experience as a student? What kind of resources were available in schools when you were a student? Oh, none. <laughs> um, in terms of how I would describe my experience as a student, I would generally sum it up as scary and very, very conflicted. Because, I mean, what may be, what may be weird for those who are students now to understand, because we have things like Day of Pink, we have um, several recognized holidays like the International Day Against Homophobia, Transgender Day of Remembrance, and so on. These were things that were not discussed in any substantive sense in school when I was there. And at the time, the challenging part was that teachers wouldn't talk about it. There'd be no mention of it. And the only context that I had as a kid for the word gay in any sense at all um, was the fact that it was thrown around as an insult. I had no idea what the word gay meant. I knew that it was bad before I knew it was a thing. Um, so at the time, it was, it was quite scary because when I eventually figured out that I was gay, uh, it was a matter of di like feeling that I was some kind of um, you know, freak, that there was something wrong with me because the only thing I knew was that it was bad. It was about the worst thing you could possibly be. It was just one of those things that was taboo. You know, that wasn't talked about. It was conceived. Even now, we occasionally face the prevailing idea that something that, that talking about people who are gay or trans or whatever has to be done in a way that's quote unquote age appropriate. And at the time, none of it was considered age appropriate. And I had fantastic teachers who were wonderful people, but they just weren't equipped. Has being openly gay helped your students approach you with their own experiences? I have students come out either as queer or trans or something to me at least typically once a year, if not once or twice a year. So I'd say yes, um, being able to share of my own experience has been extremely helpful. But I also want to, you know, I also want to point out that the impact is is super significant for kids who aren't LGBTQ because I think we have an increasing amount of role models in the media who are who are queer or who are trans. But the problem is that that's so divorced from what uh, a student's everyday experience is. And we still need role models for kids who are out and, and happy and confident that are really part of their everyday experience. I know for a fact that I'm often the only gay person that some of my students have ever met knowingly. And I think that What's important in what I do, because I, it's every so often I get accused of, you know, trying to tell kids their beliefs are wrong or change their families' minds or whatever. And I really don't think that's what I do because my message really in, in coming out to them, and this is, I'm very clear when I speak to them, is I'm not trying to change anyone's mind, I'm trying to change the way they interact with the rest of the world. Um, you don't need to you don't need to, at your core, believe that it's okay to be gay in order to treat people with respect and humanity. And speaking as an educator, it's not my place to challenge, well, certainly my place to challenge, but it's not my place to um, condemn or alter the way that my kids or their families believe. What kind of support is the school or a teacher obligated to provide? What responsibilities do teachers have? You know, according to human rights legislation, federally and provincially, it's our responsibility, regardless of the curriculum, regardless of uh, the subject area, it's our responsibility to uh, be actively and proactively inclusive of the LGBTQ plus conversation. Um, we have to. There, and I hate to phrase that like an obligation because I really don't like the, the notion that teachers do it because they feel like they're forced to or they have to do it. But the reality is we wouldn't always naturally. 
uh, because it's not our comfort zone. But really, it's no different than any other equity conversation. We talk about fighting past the fear as a professional is the first responsibility, seeking out resources actively, taking a proactive step, figuring out what I'm not comfortable with and how I can push past that discomfort, and then normalizing it. So a lot of these teachers do want to try and do want to push past the fear, but maybe they're seeing other challenges. What do you think those challenges are and how can we address them? Well, again, I, I want to go back to the fear because most of, I would argue, most of the challenges that we face in doing this work, whether it's at the administrative level, the board level, or even the classroom level with the teacher, the biggest one is fear. Absolutely. Fear. And that could take on various flavors, fear of parent or family backlash. Um, you know, as a teacher, you never want to get that phone call from a parent that says, what are you telling my kid? Especially if you're not confident in what you're telling the kids yourself. And if it's something that's new to you. Um, there's fear of saying the wrong thing. So there is a level of fear around doing it right, doing the conversation justice. And then on top of all that, there's also the fear of professional consequences. When you get parent complaints, is that going to come along? Or if you get parent complaints, I should say, is that going to come along with consequences on a professional level? Are you going to be hearing from your administrator? Are you going to be hearing from the board? Is the parent going to complain to the superintendent? And are you going to get in trouble? And unfortunately, sometimes that does happen. But I've also heard stories from, from colleagues that, uh, that are quite shocking, that um, their administrators will tell them not to, for example, disclose their identity to their kids. They'll tell them to tone down the conversation or to allow kids to leave if they feel uncomfortable talking about it, which we can't and should not be able to do. That fear is the absolutely the biggest obstacle, I think. So in terms of how we address that, well, we address those challenges by confronting them openly. We call those fears and barriers out. And we, we do that openly and unapologetically. We recognize that we have to do it. It's a human rights matter. It's a human rights conversation. And that professionally, we are safer having the conversation than avoiding it. You've talked a lot about the aspect of fear among teachers trying to address queer students and have important conversations. What advice would you have for teachers trying to make a more inclusive school environment? I think the natural consequence of creating that inclusive environment is that you're going to have kids who trust you, and that's really what you want. If students do come out to you, this is a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Um, I, th I believe that the most important thing you can do is validate. I think especially at younger ages, kids are so often told that they don't know. <laughs> they can't possibly know the, uh, who, who they are, how they identify, because they're too young. And we know, um, just from our own uh, research in the field, that this, isn't, this simply isn't true. We need to be very open to you know, accepting what kids bring to us. Um, kid tells me, kid tells me one week that they're uh, going by he, him pronouns and by the name Zachary. Okay, great. Good to meet you, Zachary. Let's, let's do this thing. And then the next week comes back and says, you know what? I was wrong. I'm, I'm he, I'm she, her, and I go by. Then accept that too. Recognize that these things are, tra can be transitory, can be fluid, and that finding out one's identity isn't necessarily something that happens in one shot. In terms of other things that you can generally do as a teacher, I think avoid practices that rely on segregating kids according to gender. We can avoid those things. We can explore other ways to work with students and all boards have the resources. And on top of everything else, find out what your students know. Figure out what place they're in. Uh, learn what they're comfortable with already, how much they know. Chances are they'll know more than you. And it's quite possible you'll have students in your class that could teach you a few things. So approach that with humility. Be open to that possibility. Learn with the kids. And especially if you're one of those people who's afraid to address it because you're afraid of doing it wrong, don't be afraid to say that. Because showing that positivity and that attitude, that's what's going to make the difference for a queer kid. Not that you're an expert, but that you're open and that, you, that your priority is to make this a conversation that is accessible, comfortable, and inclusive. When it comes to creating a queer, inclusive environment, the rights to freedom of expression and equality are obviously very important, as well as the right to freedom of association. This charter right protects your ability to join and organize groups, groups such as GSAs. 
Cecily believes that being able to create a club like a gay straight alliance and hosting queer inclusive events is a charter protected right. So building that inclusive space in your classroom and in the broader school community can be very, very important. A way that you've been involved in building that space is actually through Gay Street Alliance. Can you tell us a little bit more about how Gay Street Alliance has fit into supporting students of various gender and sexual identities? I've, I've heard of many GSA groups that will actually avoid the term Gay Straight Alliance because uh, quite, and quite fairly, it leaves out the gender part of the conversation. You know, trans kids can be gay or straight. Um, but excluding that uh, that that part, the gender part from it, um, you know, isn't something people are comfortable with. And I've seen a very variety of examples to counter this. My own, um, at my own school, the uh, the um, the GSA group is called Safe, which stands for Students Allied for Equity. They came up with that years ago, and I think it's fantastic. Um, I've heard Gender Spectrum Alliance. I've heard, uh, oh, I've heard some really cool ones. I think the most important function is to provide a safe and pressure-free space. I think there's a, <laughs> there's a prevailing idea that if you're gonna have any kind of extracurricular at school, it has to do something. You can't just have kids coming in and hanging out at recess. I don't subscribe to that. I think, uh, I think if you wanna have a GSA that, whose only purpose is to provide a space for kids to come and feel safe and do their own thing, okay, go for it. In fact, that's one of, the, one of my favorite parts of working with a GSA is just being able to go and hang out with kids in a forum and environment when they're where they're comfortable and they don't have to worry about being judged for who they are and this isn't just for kids who are out um closeted kids allied kids kids who just you know seem to seem to have trouble just being an ally even or who are just tired of having to justify and just want to be somewhere where they feel they don't have to make excuses for it especially those who come from families who may not agree with or who may have challenging views on um the queer or trans conversation. Sometimes school is the only place they can, these kids can actually find some common ground with people. Beyond that, um, I think another really important facet of GSA groups is that there's no one right, well, there's no one right way to do it. The more creative uh, staff is willing to be and the more uh, they're willing to encourage their students to think about, okay, what do you want from this? That gives them so much agency, so much power, so much flexibility, it gives them the opportunity to really go beyond their own experience. And I think that's the most important facet. Yeah, getting that space to just be yourself is so important instead of being told that you have to be an activist if you care about this, because activism can be quite exhausting and trying to figure out who you are growing up while also trying to do that can be a lot for a little little student. Yeah, it can. I, I mean, it's, there are times as an adult, I get really, really exhausted with it, even just discussing online. You can imagine what that's like for kids surrounded by the internet. I think the really scary thing about things being so focused online right now is that some of those kids, school is their escape. For students who are in really challenging family situations, to be unable to escape that even for a day uh, at a time, that's huge. Um, so addressing it means that teachers have to be really courageous and willing to push. Um, we have to make ourselves resources, accessible resources, especially because doing doing lessons and um, and such online through video means parents have greater involvement. Um, parents can overhear what's going on, which is not something we normally experience in the classroom. So doing this as a teacher involves a lot of courage um, and a lot of experience. And sometimes we don't have that. So again, it means reaching out. It means being proactive. It means making it a priority, uh, even if it's done through, through examples of media or however, just making yourself a safe, accessible space is the most important thing. And where have you seen the most progress when it comes to inclusion and equity for queer, trans, non-binary youth in schools? Well, legislation and policy have been huge um, in bits and pieces. I think certainly at the board level, I can speak, I can speak highly of the Peel Board uh, as an example, where not too long ago, a few years ago, they released a set of guidelines around gender identity and expression that were fantastic, that addressed very specific things like at what point you should be considering involving the parents and what steps can be taken without, uh, without involving the parents to validate a student's gender identity. It was quite comprehensive. And I just, again, speaking from the perspective of an ally, I thought it was, I thought it was a really strong step forward. And we've been seeing more steps forward like that as the conversation grows. Um, 
the overall attitude of the media, the kids, <laughs> kids are better than adults at this stuff by and large, is what I've found in my time in the classroom. And they, you know, they, them having the courage and bringing this forward and learning more is pushing the teachers to do the same thing. And that's the greatest progress I've seen so far. So when it comes to the progress we've seen regarding queer equality and rights in schools, have we seen the same kind of steps when it comes to race, class, different mental or physical abilities, and how those overlap and require different kinds of equity considerations? You know, it's really interesting because that intersectionality piece is something every single equity conversation struggles with. And it's there's no, there's no particularly easy answer because that can... The, Different realities can intersect in so many different ways. Being gay and being Catholic, for example, a kid might feel equally strong about both as core parts of their identity, but they may feel that those two pieces are directly in conflict. And that's, you know, that's a fairly lukewarm example because um, we're not even digging into the, the politics and the realities of, um, of race, of any of, any of those and uh, and that's also challenging because you ha- you know there's a fine line to toe, especially speaking from my own position of privilege as a white guy, between calling out the more problematic aspects uh, that exist in in uh, occasionally in within within cultures or within uh, within um, within families, between that and acknowledging that those are not necessarily truisms. Those are not those are in many ways generalizations. So we don't want to approach things from a lens that assumes that because of a culture or a faith or a race or anything like that, that um, that conversations around homophobia or transphobia are going to be any more difficult, because um, I don't think that's necessarily true. Um, but at the end of the day, teachers need to not shy away from bringing those intersections up. Alongside this intersectional lens, a lot of students may have had reasons why they don't feel accepted in their own homes. What roles do teachers and schools play when queer, trans, or non-binary students may not be accepted at home? Well, I think that there's three main things that a kid needs from a teacher in that scenario. Um, they need validation, they need trust, and they need agency. And especially when kids don't feel those three things at home, we need to give them that at school. There are so many ways in which a student can trust or can take charge of that journey at school if we let them. Uh, And as teachers, it's important we recognize that as much as we strive for families and, um, and kids and such to have a strong partnership with us, we have to recognize that a teacher is there for the kid, not the parent. So for listeners, especially our younger ones in school who may be experiencing bullying, discrimination, harassment, anything like that, what would you say to them directly? Understand and remind yourself that you're valid, that your experience is valid. The only person who can decide who you are is you. And that doesn't change because you're young. Um, Because I remember feeling, I remember being young and being worried. Not that I wouldn't, not that, not, I wasn't even most worried that I would be targeted or harassed. I was most worried that I wouldn't be believed. I would say keep your friends close. And then on beyond that, if you're, if there's a teacher or adult in your life who you trust, don't be afraid to reach out. Having someone to talk to who's been, who may have been through it or may be able to connect you more to, to people who have shared those kinds of experiences, that can make all the difference. Even just having someone to listen. Um, but you are the one who controls your journey. If you decide to come out, you do it when you feel safe and ready and not before. Don't be ashamed of who you are. Don't be ashamed of how you feel. Sometimes the circumstances of our lives force us to hide or even lie. But that doesn't mean there's anything wrong with you. And that doesn't mean you're doing something wrong by keeping those parts to yourself until you feel ready to share them. And you can find anonymous resources and supports out there as well. Reach out to the 519 Kids Help Phone, AYSP, that's Associated Youth Services of Peel. They all have services for youth and supports for youth that can be accessed by anybody. Um, and as much as it can suck to hear, it gets better because we always want to try to make it better. We want to create that better as is right now. It is worth keeping in mind that if you're going through the challenge right now, if you're feeling stuck, if you're feeling frustrated or scared or lonely, this too shall pass. It really, really will. And there will be a time that you reach in your life 
at some point, maybe now, maybe next year, there will be a time where you will look back on those experiences as, a, as truly as a memory of how things were. And you'll have come to a better place within yourself and with those around you. Keep that eye on the horizon. You'll get there. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, it's my pleasure. I had, I had a great time and I'm really flattered, as I said, uh, to, to be able to join you here. This has been wonderful. Thank you so much. A big thank you to the team of amazing volunteers who put this episode together. We could not have done this without you. Before we close, a note of acknowledgement. We wish to acknowledge the land on which CCLA operates. Toronto and CCLA are in the dish with one spoon territory. The land I'm recording on today is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is also home to many diverse First Nation, Inuit, and Métis peoples. We're grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. If you enjoyed today's podcast, please subscribe to Justice Versus wherever you get your podcasts and review us on Apple Podcasts. Thank you so much for joining us today. We hope you join us next time as we continue to learn, advocate, and educate on Canada's most crucial human rights issues. Until next time. <laughs>